Hi, everyone. Um, so now I'm going to interview, or inter I'm going to interview, but I'm also going to uh, uh, introduce the, the, the panel to my, to my uh, left. So I'm going to go in order. Um, to my immediate left is Rebecca Traster. She's a writer at large for New York Magazine, um, where she covers gender and politics. And you might uh, have seen the piece she just published pretty recently about Hillary Clinton, a cover story that was very well received. She's also the author of two books, uh, 2010's Big Girls Don't Cry, The Election That Changed Everything for American Women, and this year's All the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women, and the Rise of an Independent Nation. And to Rebecca's direct left is uh, oh, I know Jennifer Finley Boylan. Jennifer is the author of, I believe, 13 books, um, and she's also the Anna Quinlan Writer in Residence at Columbia University's Barnard College. Her 2003 memoir, She's Not There, A Life in Two Genders, was the first best-selling work by a transgender American, and she has consulted on the E! Network's show I Am Kate, as well as Amazon's award-winning series, Transparent. To her immediate left is Jennifer Dillon. I'm sorry, my notes are getting messed up. Hold on. Where did they go? I can do it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer is a founding partner at Precision Strategies, which is a communications, digital, and data targeting consulting firm. She was previously a deputy campaign manager for President Obama's 2012 re-election campaign, the, exec the executive director of the Democratic National Committee, and battleground states director for, for Obama's 2008 campaign. In her 2012 role, she oversaw the largest field, education, political outreach, and data analytics organization in the history of presidential campaigns. Next to her is Asma Khalid. She is a campaign reporter for National Public Radio, and she focuses on the intersection of demographics and politics in the 2016 election. Before joining NPR's election team, she covered politics for WB, WBUR, Boston's NPR station, where she also reported extensively on the Boston Marathon bombings and the trial of James Whitey Bulger. And last but not least is Anne Marie Slaughter. She is the president and CEO of New America and the Bert G. Kerstetter, is that how I pronounce it? Okay. Yeah, really <laughs> 66 university professor, uh, 66 university professor emerita of politics and international affairs at Princeton. Um, I probably could have like edited that down, sorry. From, from 2009 to 2011, she was the first woman policy planning director at the U.S. State Department, and previously she was the dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School and an international law professor at Harvard Law. So, um, the title of this, of this talk is The Woman Card with the subtitle Feminism and the 2016 Election. Um, part of the description that I noticed in the accompanying materials said that this panel was, or said, suddenly feminism is front and center this election season. So what I wanna pose to anyone who wants to jump in, um, is that true? It seems to me that feminism has been pretty front and center for a while, long before um, 2016, or long before this election. I, I, I will, it does, does anybody else wanna, okay. Um, so I, I agree with you that feminism, um, that this is not a sudden reemergence of feminism on the scene, though I would argue that elections, earlier elections have been a big part of creating its reemergence. And um, <clears throat> it actually, the election that I would pin a lot of it on is the 2004 election and the campaign around Howard Dean. As many of you who, who pay attention to feminism know, there was a, there was a very, um, there's a period of deep chill um, anti-feminist backlash, you know, sort of from the early to mid 80s um, through the 90s. And many of us, I think probably on this panel, grew up in that era. And when I was growing up, um, feminism was really, really out of fashion. <laughs> yeah. And it was just like a freezer. Like you didn't, you know, there, I grew up in a world in which at a very crunchy liberal high school, you know, every statement was preceded by, I'm not a feminist, but. Um, and then around the, two th what happened that was fascinating around the 2004 election is that it was the emergence of the, of the net roots. And a lot of young people went online and started organizing around the Howard Dean campaign specifically, and in a kind of um, echo of things that had happened in some of the mid-20th century social movements around the anti-war and civil rights movement in which women felt that their voices were not being taken as seriously. Within the net roots movement around Howard Dean, there were a number of women who felt that perhaps 
their perspectives weren't being taken as seriously, and they began to splinter off and began to form the beginnings of what would become, and this was on the political and activism side, what, what we would now refer to as the feminist blogosphere. Um, so that was coming out of the 2004 election, and then there was, um, this, this was around the time that, that some journalists started to write about feminism as a beat again, which hadn't really been done as common practice since the 1970s and early 80s. Um, Anna was the founder of Jezebel in what, 2007? Yeah. Right, and then the, the election in 2008, um, which brought all kinds of issues around gender and race um, and class to the fore because it was this remarkable campaign on the Democratic side between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and then Sarah Palin um, that further energized uh, a conversation around women in politics. So I agree that, that feminism is very much in play right now, but this is a conversation that has been developing. And I do think the roots of it are around politics, but obviously it also extends to culture. Um, you know, social media has been a big driver of it. So I, I wouldn't, I, I think it's predated this election. Well, the, the, the subtitle of your first book was um, the, the election that changed everything for American women, and that was in reference to the 2008 election. So. Um, I guess my what question is: Do you still believe? Do you still believe that? Do you think? Yeah, that I think it changed. It did not fix everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> or really anything. But yeah, I think it. I think it certainly shifted the way that we talk about. I think the way we talk about Hillary Clinton this time around is very different from how we talked about her in 2008. I, I, I'll just jump re yeah, in yeah. just briefly. The, I, I think it's undeniable that um, feminism is part of this election. But uh, an open question, I think, is what kind of feminism? Um, I teach at Barnard. And I'm seeing that um, my students, who uh, all identify as feminists, virtually all of them identify as feminists, are not particularly, um, they're certainly not as, as electrified by the idea of Hillary Clinton becoming the first woman president as I am. And, and, and so I'm in my late 50s, women of my generation, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm just thrilled by the, you know, by the idea uh, of that this is an historic moment. But my students are very much, are, are much like, uh, you know, their sense is, well, you know, her feminism, maybe she's a feminist, but her feminism is not my feminism. And um, so I, I think that's an interesting question, that, um, that if feminism is a part of this election, what kind of feminism and what will it, and will it mean different things to different generations. Anne-Marie, I wanted to ask well, that, you. <laughs> Hello, Anne-Marie. <laughs> yeah, Jennifer knows this exactly. So I was the Barnard commencement speaker uh, this year, and when I was announced uh, in February, I was protested, uh, and a number of students right. and faculty sent a petition to the Not Barnard... Me. No. <laughs> A Barnard administration that basically said that I was a representative of white corporate feminism, one feminism, and for those for their purposes, Sheryl Sandberg and I are the same person, right? <laughs> I mean, not we're we're quite different in many ways, but but their point was I want an intersectional, inclusive feminism, and so to the extent. I see feminism as part of this. I see my generation trying very hard not to make this election about the woman card, about to argue Hillary Clinton will be a great president because she'll be a great president. Not, we're not voting for her because, again, not in, in my personal capacity, New America, again, I have to say this every time, it's true, we're a nonpartisan organization, uh, but but I really, you know, we don't want people voting for her because she's a woman. We know that's toxic in this election. That's not the way to pitch it. Uh, and yet then at the same time having this really kind of painful debate with younger women whose goals I share, but I want to say to them, boy, you don't know, you have no idea how hard it was to get here, right? If you can elect a woman who was first lady and, and, sec, and senator from New York and secretary of state and has already run once and has all that behind her and we can't elect her, I have no idea when we'll finally elect a woman. So it's this complicated, it's about a woman, but it's not about a woman. Um, right. so, do, so do you think, do you think that the messaging either by the, Clinton campaign or Clinton supporters should really shy away from, from pointing out the historic nature of her candidacy. I mean, I realize that perhaps we, we shouldn't be uh, exhorting voters to, to vote for her because she's female, but I don't think, I don't personally think that that should be something that's off the table in terms of part of the conversation. Um, 
I don't think it should be off the table. And, and certainly, you know, when the week she won the nomination, I certainly had chills down my spine. I mean, it was, it was touching history, you know, it really was touching history. But I think, so that you don't take it off the table, but if you, she's not running as the first woman candidate to be president. She's running as candidate to be president who will be the best, most experienced president. And it's a hard line to draw. Um, Asma, so, so your work, you focus on the intersection of, of, of demographics and politics. And so how do you see this? How do you, you're mostly talking to voters, not, not, not to the candidates Precisely, or to their yes. staff. So and, and can you talk a little bit about, yeah. women voters. Yeah. And so I would say with the conversation of feminism in this election, to me, what I have consistently heard from voters, uh, particularly after who we would have as the presumptive nominees became very clear, is that I think the way we are seeing feminism discussed has a lot less to do with issues right now, I would say, because of the, the choices that we have, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And what I have consistently heard from candidates is about tone. And I think that that really benefits Hillary Clinton. So for example, I spent a lot of time recently in the suburbs of Ohio. The suburbs, I would argue, are really crucial uh, for Hillary Clinton. They um, tend to lean Republican, and I think her campaign believes that they could make some inroads there in the suburbs. Uh, and a number of those women pointed to ads that were running already in the state of Ohio, where some of Donald Trump's own words about women were being used against him. And uh, I spoke with a number of Republican women who told me that they uh, you know, necessarily were not Hillary Clinton supporters, and they didn't agree with her about everything, but the thing that held them back today, at this moment in time, for cat from casting a vote for Donald Trump were those ads. So it was not about issues. It was purely about tone and message and how he was talking about women. Um, so to me, that's kind of one of the biggest takeaways. But I will say, I. I'm intrigued by sort of this idea of not running as the first woman president or running as the first woman president, partly because I, I look back at the comparisons to 2008 and identity politics and the degree to which President Obama had really both historic levels of African American turnout, but also amazing levels of support from African Americans. And, you know, Hillary Clinton's demographic, to be blunt, I mean, it's white women. And white women. No, no African American older women. <laughs> Old, older African American her. women, but very strong. That, but her identity, if we're talking about identity oh. politics, right? Is Hillary, Hillary Clinton, she is trying. I guess what's interesting to me is her, her identity, right, is a white woman. And that group has gone for Republicans. It's a group that Mitt Romney won by 14 points four years ago. Mm. And it's a group that I think she believes she can make inroads with. But it's a group that, you know, is not bending over backwards to support her. And that I find very interesting. Right, that's one of the ironies of the fact that she is, I mean, she is regarded, as, and in fact, many of her supporters are often um, tagged as, you know, older white women who just want to see their own identities and their own priorities and perspectives reflected in the Oval Office. And the irony exactly is that married white women vote Republican, consistently. Um, and that in fact, the people who have made her the nominee are women of color, uh, that's the Democratic base, and unmarried women, including unmarried white women actually vote Democratic, well, they, vo they, voted, for, they voted for Obama, they vote Democratic. M marital status um, and race and eth ethnicity have a huge impact. I wanna say one word in defense of millennials. I wanna say something about the generational divide very quickly. I'm not a millennial, I'm 41, but um, I think that uh, a couple, two things sometimes get lost. One is this, Anne-Marie talked about um, this lack of a sense of if not now, when, and what we've been through and like what the impossibility of the past, in the past of a woman being elected president. And one of the things that I think we sometimes forget is that if you're a young person, if you're in your 20s, your political consciousness, your adult political consciousness, the years during which you've probably been paying attention to politics, are years in which Barack Obama has been the president, in which the person who was his major rival for the presidency was Hillary Clinton, um, and then Sarah Palin competed against him, in which you've seen the candidacies of Herman Cain, of Michelle Bachman, of Ben Carson, of Marco Rubio. For them, the view of who's out there in the political landscape, it's not the endless sea of white men that 
is the view that many of us who are older have. So that sense of urgency that people, that older people s seem to say, like, how can't, how, how do you not see how crucial this is? If you're a young person, you may not see how crucial and impossible it seems. And the other thing is that I think we sometimes forget that the clash of, there's always generational difference, um, and that it's really necessary to moving forward. So that you need to have a youthful energy behind, let's, let's, burn it all down, let's have a revolution. And you need to have the more pragmatic perspectives that, that is born perhaps of having seen the sausage made. So, and they balance each other out. So that you, if, if you only had the pragmatism, we probably wouldn't get anywhere very fast. And if you only had the revolutionary spirit, you'd try to have a revolution and get stopped and then give up. And you need both of them working together. So that's my defense of the millennial and the generational difference. I, I, I want to ask Jennifer Dillon a question. Um, okay, as a strategist, uh, we were just kind of talking about Trump and, 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 and kind of, you know, some of the techniques that the Hillary Clinton campaign has deployed against him already. What do you think she should do um, against him? Do you think that she's been doing enough? And how do you see... How do you see the rest of the of the of the general playing out with regards to how he approaches her? Like, what would a debate look like? <laughs> <laughs> how long do we have to talk about that? <laughs> you have um, as much time as you want. Well, first, I want to just say, you know, I come at this from two perspectives: one, as a person, and two, as someone that works in political campaigns. And as a person, I want to support Hillary Clinton for any reason that I want to, and you know, whether she's a woman or whether, you know, I've met her, whether she speaks to the fact that I have two little girls. You know, whatever that is, I want that to be fine. And that's that's my personal choice, and I think that's part of what this is about. I think for an operative and thinking about what Hillary Clinton needs to do, I think we have to really think about this beyond just big segments, beyond age, beyond gender, um, but really get underneath at an individual level. What millennials want, what what I want, also not a millennial, um, you know, what uh, older people want, what anyone wants is to be listened to, to feel like they're a part of a campaign, to feel like the things that matter to them in their lives are understood, um, that they have a voice, that they have a place and an outlet to see themselves and see the values that they share be part of that. And so I think that part of what <clears throat> opportunity we have right now and what Hillary Clinton has in the general election is to really show the stark contrast between her, the Democratic Party, the values and the issues she cares about and who she is and what she's going to do for this country and, and what Donald Trump is going to do and the Republicans that are standing behind him. But I think from a strategy perspective, we really have to talk to Jen O'Malley, Dylan, which is my, anyway, you can call me Jennifer Dylan, but that's my mother-in-law's right. name, right. so I get confused who you're talking to. Um, but, you know, me and what I care about and what, what matters in my life, but also how I want to be part of the campaign. Do I want to be an activist? Do I just want to read about it more? Do I want to see, am I, am I going to check it out on TV or is it going to be online? And then how do we recognize that there are very big differences even across this stage, across this room, that she needs to spend time and her campaign needs to spend time listening to and tapping into? And she can't do that alone, obviously. And so how does she build an organization and an operation to allow all of these voices to be part of it? It, for young people to, to have the conversations about where they see themselves and, and what they're looking at and then have a place for that to go and actually turn that into not just talking about what we care about but what we're going to go do about it. And so I think she's done a, a really great job of doing that. I think she's built an organization in all 50 states where there's a lot more outlet for people to be engaged and be part of that. And I think that she's really spent a lot of time, whether it's big events, but in particular really talking to people um, at small gatherings and small events to hear what they care about and to talk about them. And I think that's really where we're gonna see the impact and the difference between um, you know, her and, and, and Trump. In terms of debates, look, I think the debates are gonna be tough. Um, I think all of this is going to be tough. I think that's the biggest thing to say. I think um, the, the reason she could lose is because we take for granted how hard this is going to be, or we look and see how much money she has versus he has, or how crazy the stuff is that he says, and we think, oh, God, there's no way people could support him. Um, and, and that's many people could see that. And that when we become complacent, that's when we... we have uh, you know a chance of of not doing what we need to do, but in terms of the debates, I think you know he is such a loose cannon. He is someone that's going to try to, in my mind, prod her and and say things that are outlandish and go to the, all the nasty, terrible things that you could possibly go to. And I think that you know we've seen her at Benghazi; she can handle you know 11 hours of that. But I think it's going to be really important to show the the two differences in the stark contrast when they're on the stage together. Do you think he'll go for openly misogynist 
commentary towards her on the debate stage? I mean, when you say he's going to push her buttons or, or say provocative things, I mean, do you... I, you know, I, I was one of the people that thought he'd be smarter um, and, you know, really moderate himself coming into the general and, you know, go to a place that he tried to rebuild himself. Um, so I, I've been wrong um, about that, which is a good thing um, for what I do and what I believe in. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that I envision him calling her crooked Hillary on the on the debate stage, but do I think that he's going to go through the list of, the tick list of everything that uh, has ever come up and go at it one after another and not talk substance and keep coming back at that um, in ways that are just um, so beyond what normal discourse should be? Uh, absolutely, I think he would. Anne-Marie, um, you've worked with Hillary Clinton, and she's a complicated figure, as everybody knows. Uh, I want to know if you can tell me what frustrates you the most about her and what frustrates you the most about public conversation about her. So, <laughs> you don't really think I'm going to answer that first question, do you? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, so I have to say, I, I didn't know Hillary Clinton at all until she interviewed me in December of 2008, and she hired me two weeks later. So I had met her once, and she wanted, I mean, this is very Hillary Clinton. She wants to break every glass ceiling she could. There had never been a woman at policy planning. Policy planning is the big think job. It's the job that was first held by George Kennan, and it's been held by a series of men who are major foreign policy thinkers. And she didn't know me. She didn't put somebody she knew in. She went and found, went looking for a big foreign policy thinker, and she'd read an article I'd written. Um, and I think that's telling because she, there's never any lack of people who want those jobs. So she, so she hired me, and I, I spent six months just really trying to get to know her. And I'd never been in government or in a campaign, so I had a lot to learn. Uh, at, but you know, I say, and it's true. Uh, um, you know, my respect for her went steadily upward. And she, uh, what I came away thinking was she gets, she has this reputation, and there's a lot of gender in this, right? Hard worker. How often have we heard that about women, right? Knows her brief, does her homework, uh, kind of diligent, the good student. She rarely gets credit for big think. But she changed my thinking more than I changed hers. She, I came in as a, as a national security person and I left believing that, got, that development issues were as important as, national, as traditional diplomacy, which is a big think thing. So I, um, you know, does she get irritated at times? Yes. Um, we were talking earlier, though, she's persuadable. Uh, she is definitely persuadable. She may not be happy about being persuaded. I mean, if, I, if you're art, but you know when you're working for her, she may get irritated, but if you hold on and keep advancing your view, sh you can persuade her, which, which uh, uh, was, I thought, something, something important. In terms of, you know, what, what frustrates me the most? So much. I mean, just so much. The, the Dumple standards are just unbearable. I mean, you know, when... when <laughs> the, one that, the one that got me the most is when she's being accused of being shrill. And right. Bernie, I don't care what you think about Bernie, you can love him or hate him, but the man had one register, right? <laughs> and it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's loud, it's obnoxious, it's ranting. If Hillary Clinton did that at all, and she did it sort of once in one debate and just got nailed for being the banshee, the Herod, and all of that stuff. So I'm, it still bothers me, and it bothered me in 2008. I was a Barack Obama supporter, and it was the kind of just flagrant sexism with the way she was treated that really reawoke my Virginia feminist roots. And I just said, this just, this can't stand. Uh, and there's still a lot of it. Do you think it's, it's being, it's being explicated and called out more though I now do. than it was in 2008? I absolutely do. And the major thing you see is so much less commentary on her physical appearance. It's really striking. I mean, that message has gotten through, unless you're prepared to talk about Donald Trump or whoever else. So yes, I think it is better. But it's, you know, it's like overt bias and subconscious bias. A lot of the overt stuff is we've gotten rid of, but there's a tremendous amount of subconscious stuff going on, or semi-conscious stuff. Uh, so Rebecca and I were talking earlier about um, the fact that Hillary was, was voted the most admired woman um, in December of 2015, it was the 20th time she'd been, uh, I don't want to say it's an award, but bestowed that honor. 
and uh, how it's possible for someone to be so admired and yet such ha and yet have such high and favorables. And I, what I want to know is if someone can answer that question, but also too if 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 the rest of the panelists have those kind of complicated feelings about about her, and if you can tease them out a bit. I mean, I can talk a little bit about conversations with voters. I think that that's a fairly common perception that that Democratic women who are supporting her have expressed to me. Um, you know, people have told me that they don't trust her, that they uh, don't know if she's always genuine, but they admire tremendously what she's accomplished. Um, I did a series where I, I was actually going around to, as I was saying, a lot of suburban communities in Ohio, um, both interviewing, you know, Republicans and Democrats. And to me, what was so interesting about the conversations around Hillary is that people who admit that they will vote for her expressed a displeasure with her, or maybe even just um, not an enthusiasm or a love for their vote, to cast their vote for her. But yet they felt that she was tremendously experienced and had accomplished a lot. There is that disconnect. Um, what it's attributable to, you know, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what it's exactly attributable. I mean, I think part of it may be, I mean, a part of it may be that Hillary is a candidate does not sort of, and I don't, I don't know even how to say this. I mean, look, if we could look at the 2008 election, I don't think that she energizes or creates the enthusiasm writ large as she campaigns the way that other candidates did. I was uh, in Ohio earlier this week when Hillary Clinton and Elizabeth Warren were campaigning together in Cincinnati. That is unlike any other Hillary Clinton event that I had ever attended in my life. I mean, it was, they, they had to shut down the venue because it had filled to capacity. Uh, some young women, millennial women, were jumping up and down as Elizabeth Warren and Hillary Clinton took the stage together. I, I think that Hillary Clinton struggles as a campaigner. She is not a natural campaigner. Who, she says that herself. Yeah, yeah. Right. and That's I think that maybe she, that is part of the sort of incompatibility that people have, where they say that they will vote for her, but they don't, they're not necessarily excited by that option. Because she has a history. I mean, she, what she has is uh, is a resume and a um, a long line of accomplishments. And in, in a strange way, in our in campaigns, what we want is is a, is a dream. You know, we we want. Uh, you know, if you, if you think about Barack Obama, you know, or Bernie Sanders, or um, uh, I don't know, uh, just um, a, a lot of yeah. I mean, people like the idea of voting for a dream. And Hillary, I mean, I think Hillary, I mean, I see her as a dream, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people see her as, in a way, her disadvantage is that she's accomplished so much. And, and we really, in a way, we don't vote for accomplishments. We, we vote for an idea and for, and, for a, and for a hope. Can I, I just want to add to that. I think one of the challenges is that she is so well known, but she's not known well at all. And what I mean by that is we know the stories, we know the time, you know, the, the work that she's done, we know when her, pre her husband was president, but I don't know that people have gotten to the root of, um, you know, her values and where she started from, and I think you see that a lot in the messaging. You see that in the first ads that the campaign put out when they moved into the general election. These were talking about, you know, her family, her life, um, you know, the struggles she went through, um, what drives her, her faith, and, and I think that that's something that you know, maybe people at some level know, but that's not where they put their focus on. And it's also not what's talked about as much. And so I think it really is going to require the campaign and Hillary herself to make that very clear. And you see that often, but I think that that's gonna be an important level of this. And I think the real question is for these people that admire her, but maybe are not sure that, you know, uh, she's she's the one that they have their heart and soul in and, and, and don't feel the same way that they were when they voted for the president um, now. You know, w can they get to know her? Can they see a different side of her? And I think there's real opportunity for that, in, in, in part because she's running against Donald Trump. And I, I can't see a, a starker contrast between the values that she fights for, has fought for, and where she comes from, and where he has. And in some ways, maybe he's the perfect foil for her to be able to, to show people who she really is in a way that they haven't seen uh, as often. Is the idea that she that she's, uh, feels unknown attributable to her? Or is it because we expect women to give more of themselves. Um, I mean, I, I, I want to know if, it, if this is like a gendered expectation. I mean, I, I don't know that I know Barack Obama any more than I know Hillary Clinton. Um, and, and I don't know that we'd be talking about him that way, although some Republicans did. You know, they, they described him as being a, a cipher of sorts, or that he was you know, going as, so far as to say that he was a, a secret Muslim who wanted to bring Sharia law. But um, Rebecca, 
I, I want to I wanna kind of address this to you and, every, and everyone else, but it seems to me that I, I, I'm not sure that Hillary's problem with connecting with voters is her own fault. She may not be a con good well, campaigner. She's not the easiest campaigner. So I have, I have a, th this is sort of a combination of what Jen was just saying and your question about her popularity and then her high unfavorables. So I think that the public is very resistant to absorbing her as a human being because those messages about who she is, whether, and she has tried it from every angle. The first ad, before, not of the general election, but over a year ago before she did her speech at Liberty Island and entered at the primary campaign was like, it, it was Marion Wright Edelman talking about her youthful work for the Children's Defense Fund. It was about her, she, her speech was about her mother. She's tried it as the grandmother. She's tried it as the mother. She's tried it as talking about her work for the Children's Defense Fund. She's tried talking about her youth. People are resistant. It's not that she won't, t she isn't comfortable with the press. She does not like the press. She doesn't, you know, there is, that's a very valid critique. And she's not a comfortable big stage campaigner. But it is also true that she has tried to let people know who she is and that people are resistant to understanding her as a full human. Mm -hmm. And that that's a real challenge. I think she can make a hundred ads about her life, like, the, and, and people are still going to have a hard time understanding that she's a human be being because there is, there remains in our head something fundamentally incomprehensible about an ambitious woman who wants to be the president of the United States. And that's not, that's not a model of femininity that we understand, and it's not a presidential model that we yet understand, which is one of the reasons that these things are so important, because the individual figures, even though they're very limited in their symbolic and representational power, begin to, to change our view. And the question about her, I have been obsessed, as somebody who's been writing about Hillary for over a decade, about this weird, when she has a job, when she's doing her job, People love her. She is, she is popular. Her favorability ratings are high. Everybody thinks she's terrific. They make memes, texts from Hillary. She's a badass. We love Hillary. And then that was true when she was in the Senate. It's true when she's in the State Department. And then she starts running, and her unfavorables go through the roof. Nobody trusts her. Nobody knows her. She's every single thing that bad, and she has done a number of really of questionable things, as many politicians who've been in public life have. Um, every single one of those begin things begin to define her more than anything positive anybody's ever felt. And I've wrestled with this. Is it just, we like a woman when she's doing a job, but not when she's in forward motion? Do we not like her when she's competing against a man? And Elizabeth Warren, to me, has recently been the key to this. Because people throughout this campaign have said to me, no, but it's not this woman. If it were only Elizabeth Warren, Elizabeth Warren's a great po And I've been saying over and over again, yeah, but you forget when she was running for the Senate. Yeah. She was, she was written about in exactly the same terms that Warren, Hillary is. Warren. Elizabeth Warren. When she was running for her Massachusetts Senate seat, everybody now says, no, everybody loves Elizabeth Warren. It's not, you know. No. When she was running for the Massachusetts Senate, you can look this up. There are tons of stories about her being a wooden candidate. She's not a natural on the stump. She reads as elite. She doesn't connect to voters. She's, she, was, she was written about as a very bad politician when she was campaigning for that Massachusetts Senate seat. Then she got in the Senate. We all love Elizabeth Warren. Fascinating thing happened last week, that when she endorsed her, and, and she's been written about, for example, in the New York Times and other places, as basically like the Pope right now. Everybody has to go kiss her ring. She's so popular. Everybody needs her blessing. Everybody loves Elizabeth Warren. It is completely understood that everybody loves Elizabeth Warren on the left. Last week when she endorsed Hillary, she gave an interview to Rachel Maddow. And at the end of that interview, I don't know if people in here watched that interview. No. The end of the interview. Rachel Maddow says this, this is a great interview, and she says, you know, Ed Rendell's been out saying, like, you couldn't be the president. Like, you know, the question of is she going to be the vice presidential candidate. Um, you're not prepared enough, you're not experienced enough to be the president. Y tell me, do you think you could be the president? And Elizabeth Warren just says, yeah, of course I could be the president. We're like, it was great. It was no apology, no breath, no, yeah, of course I could be the president. So <laughs> the next, it was either the next day or the day after, the New York Times writes a story about Elizabeth Warren. You can look this up. Elizabeth Warren is imperious as she walks through the Senate halls. She doesn't talk to people. She's cold. She doesn't, okay. It, suddenly there's a new Elizabeth Warren figure and she is a chilly person who does not connect. And I was like, there it is, that's a thing, okay. <laughs> it's a, it is a woman announcing she is capable and would be the best for the job. Which is fundamentally what a campaign is because you're out there on a stage saying, I'm the better person than this, than all these other people. I'm the most qualified for this job. And Warren did it in the context of the Maddow interview where she said, of course, I could be the president. It, we, it, that woman becomes alien to us. 
The woman who goes out there and says, I'm the most qualified for this, I can do this, becomes alien to us, like, instantaneously. That's my, that's my new theory. <laughs> well, and I'll just add to that, Hillary's generation, uh, which she's 10 years older than I am, we were taught that, right? We were taught that completely. I always tell the story of my father saying, and he, to be fair to my father, he says he was joking, I'm going to believe him. But when I, when I you know, went out to play tennis with a boy at 14, it was don't lose your head and win. Right? I mean, it was all about you cannot put yourself forward as an equal to a man. You will never get a man. And that's still true, right? It's you can't be openly ambitious. And she was raised with that completely, even if she hadn't been. You're right. The, the vision, the, it's, a, it's very deep. I want to know about everyone's thoughts. I'm going to ask Jennifer, O'Malley Dillon, about Elizabeth Warren and if you think she should be the VP pick. Oh, a great question. Well, well, well. <laughs> well, I won't answer that. Um, so what, what I would say, first of all, and what I say all the time, is I, I, I truly believe the most important thing for Hillary Clinton is to pick someone she can govern with. I think one of the secrets to you know President Obama and Joe Biden, beyond them just being two of the most amazing people ever to walk uh, on the earth, um, is that you know they had a great partnership in very different ways, and they both you know filled gaps of each other. I mean, it's like a, a you know good relationship in general, um, and I think that they that really helped you know in hard times and 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 good times for them. And I so I think in part. F f I mean, I, I don't know her very well, but my sense is, and, and what I would just think is most important is thinking about governing. I think it's really easy to make short-term political decisions on a campaign. Who can be the best attack doc? Who's the one that can hold up in the debate? Who's the one that fills this strategy about this state? And, you know, who's going to get us this type of voter? You know, I don't think any of that really matters. You know, you can consider it. You should go through all the angles. Everyone should have a good perspective. But that's not why she or anyone else should choose their VP. And I think when we've seen people make those choices, Says, a la Sarah Palin, um, you know, you run into big problems, and and that's obviously the most extreme case. But you know, do I think Elizabeth Warren could be a great VP? Sure. Do I think she has an incredibly great voice in the Senate and and broader? Sure, absolutely. Do I think that um, you know there are there are lots of things that we saw at that event that really brought out um, you know so many different levels and sides of of Hillary Clinton on that stage and and the energy um, and seeing someone like Elizabeth Warren being being able to take Donald Trump to task in a way that he does to other people, but just with a higher level of respect, um, you know, was amazing. But she doesn't have to be the VP to do that. So I, I think really it's a it's a really important role that she plays regardless of the role that she has in this campaign. I think we have already seen um, a lot of the Bernie supporters come on board with Hillary even faster than we saw um, in, in 08, and I think that's really important. Um, I think she's going to continue to be an important voice in, in either um, capacity, but I think the choice has to be about governing more than campaigning. Yes. Um, I want to ask one last question, and then we're going to uh, take audience questions. So I, I'm not really quite sure how to phrase this, but it seems to me there are, t there are times that I've thought about Hillary's candidacy and her potential win of the presidency and how unfair it seems that she has to run against Donald Trump in order to get there. Um, I think Rebecca once said to me that, of course, this is how it worked, that, that it somehow felt inevitable, not that it was Trump, but that, but that she was going to be matched with, you know, I, I don't know how you described it, but, um, but, but I, I'm curious, is, is there a feeling of kind of um, among you of disappointment that this is, this is her challenger, not because he's going to be easy to beat, but just because he's such a low life? <laughs> <laughs> I think that you can <laughs> I mean, he is the quintessential alpha male, right? That is how he is running. But I would argue that in many ways, he is perhaps Hillary Clinton's best asset. I mean, I cover demographics, right? And we look a lot at how you can kind of carve the electorate out. Um, there were a lot of questions about whether African-American voters would really turn out at the same rates or support Hillary Clinton at the same level that they supported Barack Obama. Early polls are indicating that yes, they will. We're seeing you know, Latinos and Asian Americans solidly line up behind her. We're seeing indications that white women who as a block had voted Republican in the last election could support her. I mean, in many ways, I don't know that Hillary Clinton needs to sort of make a lot of overtures to win over additional voters. I think she her best campaign strategy, I mean, I think in many ways, is to continue to allow Donald Trump to say whatever he does and um, 
And that in many ways has been her asset. I mean, but I will say that on the question of VP, I think what is interesting too, I have been you know, telling my editors for some time that I think what is so interesting about this election is that I think there are really two swing blocks and they're not the swing voters that people traditionally think. They will be white women and in some states, white men. Mm -hmm. And I think for those reasons, uh, who Hillary Clinton chooses as a vice presidential candidate, I think will be a very safe pick and that would be arguably her best strategy. Can I ask one other, That's what other, I was gonna say. One yes. other thought on the, on this is that for, um, for, for LGBTQ Americans, um, Donald Trump being Hillary's uh, adversary here is, is a little strange in that um, of all the Republicans running, um, he's been uh, the least anti-LGBT uh, over, over the last you know, five, five, 10 years. Um, and in some ways he was actually um, a, a, a very pro LGBT person. He was the first, he, you know, he owns the Miss Universe pageant. Did you know that he was, he allowed transgender women to compete in the Miss Universe pageant um, going back eight years now. Um, and he uh, has said some very um, uh, positive things. Um, at, and so, and he, of course he sends out these tweets about how uh, queer people should, should be voting for him because he you know, won't allow people into the country who are going to kill us or something. Anyway, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a curious thing. This was thing. post Orlando, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. This was post Orlando. Yeah, okay. yeah. And, and yet, um, he, he's also said, he, but he's going to appoint judges to the, to the Supreme Court who will overturn marriage equality. I mean, that's another thing. And so what I don't really know, actually, is what he actually believes. I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I get the sense, I don't know what his, what his core is besides, besides himself. And so I think for, for, um, for Hillary, in a weird way, uh, the biggest problem is knowing what to, how, to how, do you, how do you debate somebody who's kind of fundamentally uninterested in anything? <laughs> But himself. Except, yeah, except yeah, for yeah. himself. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do you latch on to that? Yeah. How do you have a conversation with someone yeah. who's really not listening? I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. But um, did you say one last thing, Anne Just Marie? in terms of, of her versus Trump, I, I think what the, the advantages I see, in addition to what other people have said, although I strongly second the idea that this is no time for complacency. I mean, this is just no. absolutely yeah. no time for complacency. Uh, but, you know, Hillary, as a, per, as, as, as a candidate, as a person, in terms of who she is and what she believes, she does want to bring this country together. She said that, she said it for a long, uh, she, and, and you know, it was interesting in 2008 in her great speech was, you know, you shouldn't have been in it for me. You should have been in it for the people that, that I represented. And in a normal field, I think it would be hard for her to make the argument that she's bringing the, she wants to bring the country together, but he is so polarizing. Right? He is so divisive and so, you know, he is, his strategy is to divide. And in that context, that's the, the only context of all the Republicans running where I think she can credibly be seen as a more unifying candidate. And that's very important in this election because regardless of what happens, we need to come back together. So I, in that sense, again, you know, would, would you have chosen him for all the reasons you've said? No, but I think that's a, a small silver lining. Um, so we're going to take audience questions, and I'm going to ask that um, the audience ask questions, actual questions, and not just <laughs> um, uh, kind of pontificate, which is, what, which is what has happened some other time. So please ask the question. Um, raise your hand. Uh, there's a gentleman right here. Yes, forgive me, a woman with a yellow microphone. I, for, I forgot your name. Jennifer O'Malley. Hi. <laughs> Jen? Yeah. yeah. This is a, a question not about feminism or the woman card, but about ground game. You were in charge of the ground game, and bravo for you. We see reports that Trump does not have a ground game, and I don't believe everything I read. And obviously, Hillary does have a ground game. Can you give us any insight into the differing ground game, the approach to going out and reaching to voters and, and, get, and getting them in the two different campaigns? 
Yeah, absolutely. I could talk about the ground game all day long. Um, so, you know, it is true that Donald Trump does not have staff on the ground, um, and, you know, he is starting to build that up. However, what is also true is that the Republican National Committee has had staff on the ground for a very long time. And in battleground states, you know, they have uh, as many as 100 in, in some of them. And so while uh, his actual apparatus is minimal, the RNC and the Republican parties have been building a foundation. They've done a lot of work internally. We saw this in 2014, that there was more ground work, staff, and volunteers on the ground um, up against the big Senate races, uh, which obviously um, they did a good job on. So there is, I would, I would not say that there is nothing there, and I would not take for granted what exists on the Republican side. They've gotten better on data in, in since 2008 and 12. They've gotten better on technology. They've certainly learned a lot of the lessons. They've spent resources on actually motivating and engaging and educating their voters, which is something that they haven't, one, had to do in the past, but also haven't spent resources on. That being said, it pales in comparison to what we're doing on the Democratic side. I think we saw in 08, in particular, um, the first time in a long time, the kind of organization, the, just the sheer volume of people and offices, and you know, there's been lots of talk about the data we used and the technology, and it just was a different time in terms of how people engage in campaigns with digital engagement and, and more direct conversations. 12 built on that, obviously, and we had a long time to do that, and that was one of the special gifts of 2012 that we had many years to, to really build out that organization and hone it. I think the, the Clinton campaign from day one has, you know, while they've been very focused on the primary and they had a legitimate primary, has also been thinking about the long game. And so data-driven, strong technology, new technology, thinking about how to engage on the ground, not just doing field and knocking on doors, but digitally, and how do you, how do you build events online? How do you think about texting and, um, you know, and, and reaching people in, in platforms that they want to engage in the campaign and, and with what? So I think um, you know, they have a really, really strong foundation. The, the national party and the state parties have very strong foundations. They have thousands of people full-time working on the ground in all the battleground states, and as I said, they'll have staff in all 50 states. So I feel like they're in a, a really good place, but they have a lot of work to do to mobilize, engage. There's a lot of election laws that have not been in our favor. We have a lot of education work that we have to do, a lot of people that we have to register. Um, so you know, the burden is on the Democratic side to do the groundwork, and that's why they're positioning themselves to be able to do it. Thanks. Um, there's a, a woman right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Jenny. I've been a fan of Hillary Clinton since I believe it was her first book, It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. Was that in the mid 80s? Yes. And do I remember correctly that her parents were Republicans and she was a Republican until Bill ran for governor in Arkansas? No, no she, was, she became a Democrat while she was an undergraduate at Wellesley. Okay, so she, so she was raised by Republican parents. My point is, isn't it time for us to remind America that she has a base of understanding from her parents what it feels like to be a Republican? And isn't it time that she is told that, she, that we tell America that she understands both sides of the aisle and she more, better than anyone could bring the two sides together? I think she, she does see herself that way, but also just as Rebecca pointed out, I'm just going to do this because if you haven't read Rebecca Traister's uh, article on Hillary in New York Magazine, the fact that you're here means you should read that article. You, you really have to read that article. It's phenomenal. Uh, but the point is, I think she would say she, she builds relationships. She, she takes the time to build relationships. And again, yeah, when she was in the Senate and when she was Secretary of State, I, I used to have people all the time come up to me and say, I'm a Republican, I didn't like Hillary Clinton, I so admire her. Or I, it, so so there, I think, I think sh she sees it that way, but I'm not sure the country will, will, will I mean, it's, it's a hard message to, to craft. It's also slightly perilous because one of the, one of the, she has a very tricky path in that regard because one of the things that she comes under the harshest criticism for is having moved, the perception that she moved from this, to the center, yeah. um, so that she was regarded in the early part of her um, public life in the national eye as a sort of radical liberal firebrand. Even though she's never been like a radical, <laughs> she was, you know, when she became first lady, she was regarded as the, as the crazy left flank in the Clinton administration. And in, in the years in between, she did modify and did move to the center, but 
this has been a liability to her because then she's perceived as a flip-flopper and someone too willing to compromise with Republicans. So it is an extremely perilous path that she walks as far as advertising herself as somebody who could, and, and the other thing to remember is that the Republican Party of today is very different from the Republican Party that, that she was raised with. So there's, there are different kinds of levels of, of coming together. Right, but even the Republicans she could have been running against if it hadn't been Donald Trump are very different kinds of Republicans than the Republicans she was raised yeah. with. Um, I, w I wanna, uh, yeah, there's a, it's a young man here. Do you wanna, oh, there's a microphone coming. We have about five minutes. Maybe we can take one or two more questions. Hi. Um, I was, I don't know if there's really an answer to this, but I was just wondering what you guys think differentiates us from Brazil that was able to already elect Dilma Rousseff and Germany that had Angela Merkel and even England that like way back had Margaret Thatcher and what has kept us so long from being able to even think about electing Hillary Clinton as pre president when third world countries and first world countries alike have already done it. Wow. <laughs> It's a great, it's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know. What's interesting is that actually, if you look at our statistics of women in top jobs, we're better than any of those countries, uh, in, certainly in the private sector. So it's not that we 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 have stronger traditions of uh, women, uh, gender equality in many ways than those countries. It's more, there is something about the, the, the top and, the, and maybe particularly the American president is the most powerful person in the world. And that is a very alpha male job. I think, it, and in that sense, it may be, it's an even bigger thing than in some of those other countries. Although, you know, you note in Britain, it was Maggie Thatcher in the 80s, we haven't seen a woman since. Indira Gandhi, we haven't seen a woman since. Golda Meir, we haven't seen a woman since. So, uh, you know. <laughs> we also don't have parliamentary politics. Yes, that's so that's the big, so there are a lot of, there. So there are a lot of countries, the, the way we organize our political system, so countries vary in the way that they, so in many cases, you're not electing, in other countries, you're not necessarily electing a leader, you're electing a party, and within that, and there are countries that have quota systems, um, not all of the ones that you mentioned, everybody operates slightly differently, but there are all kinds of um, systems of election where you might, ha there might be requirements that there be more women within a particular party, and then a, perhaps a person within that party rises to the top, and it's not, it, what we have in the United States is this two-party system where we're voting on individuals, not necessarily on issues or on parties, and the structures mean that it becomes a referendum on individual people, not necessarily on ideas or ideology, and, or, or, and so the systems themselves have made it slightly more challenging in this country. Um, we can take one more, there's a, there's a woman right here in the, in the blue, Nina McLemore, Anne-Marie said that this is not a time to be complacent. So in addition to money, what can the people in this room do if they believe Hillary is the best choice for president? Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's no place in this country where you can't do something to volunteer and reach people. We know that the biggest impact somebody can have is to communicate to their own networks, to people that you talk to, you know, that could be your friends, that could be your family, Make sure they're registered to vote. Make sure they understand what's at stake. Make sure they know what they need to do to vote. Think about the people you know in battleground states. Those matter. Um, but also make sure that you're communicating about why you're supporting her. The, the louder our voices are about why we personally are supporting her and what we f see is at stake, the more power we will have, that it's not just her voice alone. And then you get online, go volunteer. Um, you know, there's a million different ways that you can do it. Um, and, you know, frankly, if, if you're in a place where, you know, you, you live in a battleground state, they need housing. Um, they need people that are bringing food. They, if you don't like making phone calls, you can do letters. I mean, you name it, there's work to be done and it can be done anywhere. But most importantly, talk to the people in your own networks about why you are supporting her, what's at stake, and why she should be the president.
Thanks. And this, this is not a, a direct answer to that question, but if you're uh, a, an LGBTQ person in this country, if you, if you can find the courage, especially if you're transgender, come out and be known so that people will see you as a human being. And when we are seen as human, people will understand that all the laws that are being um, created, mostly by Republicans right now, are dehumanizing us and making us um, out to be something that we're not. And um, Hillary, I believe, is someone who can protect us and st um, make, it, make us known um, as citizens of this country who demand equal protection and who deserve equal protection under the law. So that's a... <laughs> and and who, who don't deserve to have laws about uh, bathrooms and in, in, invented out of out of hallucinations, uh, who do not whose existence is not seen as some sort of get out of jail free card for predators. Uh, there is if well anyway, I'm I'm taking us some, to to a, to a different panel, but um, uh, we should all um, we should all be known, and um, I hope that that will create um, a fairer country for us all. I want to thank um, our panelists, Rebecca, Jennifer, Jennifer, Asma, and uh, Anne Marie. And I want to thank everyone for coming out and asking such great questions. So, you know, I wish we could stay another hour and discuss all this because I feel like we just started. But thanks so much.